Hello everyone. Welcome back to another session of PostRails webinar. Today we have a very interesting photographer. Uh, has photographed a lot of our birds from India. His name is Avinth Venkatram. He is a full-time finance professional and he has traveled across the uh, across India to photograph uh, birds and a lot of his books uh, has been featured in some of the top wildlife magazines and field guides. He has also published a coffee table book named Books of Pulikat. So let's uh, welcome Aravind to join us. Hey, Amos. Hello, Aravind. Good evening. Uh, thank, thanks, Amos, for the opportunity. Yeah, good to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. Good to good to connect with people. Yeah. So, and uh, we are equally excited to uh, hear from you, your experience, and uh, especially uh, this is a new subject, the shorebirds. Uh, nobody uh, have uh, come with this topic, so we are eagerly waiting to hear and uh, learn more about the shorebirds and how they, uh, how can we photograph them, where to find, when to find, everything. Well, that's right. I know shorebirds are not something that a lot of people find interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, few like me kind of go behind them so 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 passionately, and there's quite a lot uh, in India who does it, right? It's not just me. Uh, across the world, as well, there are a lot of organizations that work specifically for shorebird conservation. So one of the you know important uh, birds when you talk about migration. So that's why I thought you know a topic that we should discuss on. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Let me quickly uh, you know share my screen and then uh, do a quick uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, I think Hermes took the uh, pain to introduce me, so he saved a bit of time for me. <laughs> uh, let me but still kind of go through, uh, uh, go in terms of what he said, right? Yes, I'm a full-time finance professional. Uh, birding and the nature is something passionate and close to me. It all started in 2011, actually, when I started kind of like, you know, taking photography as a topic uh, and as a serious, uh, you know, interest. Uh, prior to that, it was all about seeing birds or wildlife across the country, just go there, be in the forest, experience the nature. But then it really hit on me, you know, in terms of why don't I document the species that I see around? And that's when it all started. Uh, a lot of people might ask me, why not mammals and why birds, right? That's also got to do with where I come from. Chennai, yeah. fortunately or unfortunately, is, is far off to all the wild, I know, major tiger hotspots of the country. And the connectivity <laughs> at that time when we started was still not that good, uh, right? So what was easy and what was quick was the connection to the birds. You had a lot of shows to go around. You kind of, uh, you know, when you move around Chennai itself, there's a lot of habitats and, uh, you know, wonderful marshes. So that's where it all started. And from then on, uh, from then on, right from 2011, I've been actively, uh, you know, photographing birds. So far, I've covered about 700 plus species in India. This is extensively oh. across the uh, country, right? Uh, I was starting with Hermes earlier. So yeah. I'm lucky, fortunate uh, that, you know, uh, towards the end of 2021, after the COVID, uh, you know, hit all of us, I was able to take a couple of months break just to be with the birds. I mean, kind of run around the entire Himalayan, uh, range right starting from the Uttarakhand to all the way to Larnachal and then uh, you know photograph some amazing species that we are blessed to be with all right so uh, yes uh, some of my images have been published uh, on the field guides and across few magazines but I took a bit of interest I wanted to utilize the time that I had during COVID so I was kind of thinking through what do I do when I'm sitting at home all right that's when mm -hmm. this uh, topic came up why don't I you know try my hand on publishing a, a quick you know coffee table book uh, didn't do okay. this as a full fledged publication, didn't uh, kind of do many copies, but what I wanted to do is see if, you know, my images are worth a print and then are able to kind of uh, invoke interest in people around me, right? Yeah. That's where it all started. So what I did is one of the places where I frequent uh, around Chennai, which is on the Pulika. So I started, uh, you know, working on that book covering 50 species that I photographed from Pulika and okay. uh, you know, published that book uh, in late 2020. And uh, did share it with few uh, people as well, uh, right? So those who were having interest on the the Vedas, especially, I kind of uh, you know shared a free copy with all. And then now you know, kind of thinking about making it better in the future, wanted to bring out a better book, uh, right? With a lot more content, a lot more details of the experiences that I've had. And today I'm here to share some of those experiences, right? Uh, in terms of 
uh, what do I photograph with? What's my gear? One question that keeps up, keeps coming up whenever you're on any forum, any discussion, right? So yes, I do photograph with the Canon 7D Mark II, and recently upgraded myself to an R5 as well, and shoot with the 600mm f4 lens. Uh, from a, I'll, I'll go further specifically on why I, I did touch upon the gear. Uh, before that, I just want to quick, quickly introduce showbirds to people, all right? So showbirds are waders, typically are those birds that you find around the shores. Uh, in India, you all know that we have a very vast coastline, all right? The entire western range and the eastern coast is so vast and so wide that there are so many waders, there are so many birds around that. And <coughs> in India, there are about 80 plus species of waders that has been recorded. This includes those which you very rarely see, which are passing through India during migration times, and those that winter yeah. in India, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Kerala, for example, or Goa, for example, right? Has been hotspots when it comes to this, this vagrants. Every year they produce some rarity for India, which has not been seen in the past. I know a few years back there was a record from Kerala on a pectoral sandpiper, uh, from Goa on the Asian doe, which is, right? Which are not generally seen in India. Maybe because they're, they're somewhere there in the coast, but given the vast coastline, it doesn't, you know, the binoculars don't find them that often. So that's why, you know, where this gets me interested, you, every time okay. you hit the coast, you want to look for something uh, new and something interesting. Mm -hmm. And all the, uh, you know, when I talk about where does it's, it's not just limited to the uh, sandpipers and the plovers, but also the pratting coals and the coasters, which you don't see in the coast, but you see more in grasslands, are also typically classified under waders. Uh, some of the interesting yeah. facts about waders, all right? Uh, bar tail godwits. There has been uh, tagged records of a bar tail godwit flying non stop from the Arctic to all the way to the Australian coast and the New Zealand coast, all right? And that, that's mm -hmm. the typical, uh, you know, capacity or the capability of these birds when they go, when they go on the migration. They are long, long distance migrants. They prefer habitats which are uh, so suitable for them across the coast. Today, I was casually looking at one of the articles, right, that talks about a biofilm. What is typically a biofilm is nothing but when the water hits the shores, there is a layer at the top which forms, which provides key feeding materials to these birds. And that's that's been identified as biofilms. And these biofilms are one of the reasons why, you know, these birds migrate as well. Okay. And uh, the best time to show, you know, photograph showbirds, they are during the winters because most of them are migrants. There are few which are uh, <clears throat> found throughout the year, but largely October to March is, is generally preferred time to look at vagrants, the waders. However, mm -hmm. April and May has been the best times if you ever wanted to look for waders because that's the time when they change their colors to their breeding plumages. So from the drab looking birds, you will find most attractive birds, all right? They, they just transform so much that April and May, if you can bear the heat in India, <coughs> especially in Chennai's coast, right? Then you get to yeah. see some of the birds which are, which transforms itself. And um, for those who are still interested in to see how those birds uh, transform, right? One of the examples that I keep telling people is to look at ruffs. Ruffs, when they come to India, they look very drab, nothing exciting about it whenever you see it in India. But if you get a chance, do look for the images on the internet about Rough on the breeding plumages. It's a whole set of transformation, and and so that tells you how much of importance these uh, you know locations, these these wintering hotspots are, because the feeding is so important for these birds that when they migrate back to the breeding grounds, they have a healthy breeding season. In India, okay. typically when we talk about uh, showbirds, uh, it used to be Jamnagar and still is Jamnagar when it comes to uh, the showbirds. But over the years, thanks to many photographers, many people interested in the birders, the, some <coughs> new places has been uncovered, right? Alibaga, Rakshi near Bombay, Kundapura in Karnataka, again, Pulikat near Chennai, Point Kalimar has been a hotspot, Goa. Most of the places have now been on the map in terms of, you know, hotspots to see showbirds and waders. Okay. I'll uh, move on to in terms of talking about photographing them. So what are the key things that people have to consider when you when you want to look for showbirds and when you want to photograph showbirds? First and foremost, look for the tides. 
right? Since these are birds that are around the shows, tides play a very important role in terms of maximizing your sightings of the birds, whether mm -hmm. for a for a photographic perspective or to generally see the birds. <coughs> Low tides provides better opportunity for uh, the waders because when the water level recedes, the uh, small islands pop up. And that's the time when the crabs and the other small uh, insects come out. And that's what these waders love, right? So they, they wait for these uh, islands to open up and then they start feeding actively during the low tide. And high tide, birds don't find much of opportunity to feed. So they may conglomerate in one place and then they may, they may stay there till the tide recedes, right? And especially for people who are interested to look at terns and uh, gulls as well. High tide is one of the best time to photograph, uh, you know, turns and gulls because when the water level is high, the gulls and turns can't feed. So they all, you know, group up together in one island that is available. And then that's the time you can, you know, see them uh, much closer. Otherwise, you will see turns and gulls flying across, right? Yeah. So that, that's, that's, in, that's the importance of tides. So looking at, uh, if you're planning for any birding trip, anything especially focused on waders, look at how mm -hmm. your tides are. Low tide, typically the tides are uh, recurring twice a day. Between a span of six hours, there is one tide that changes, right, from a low tide to a high tide. So it's very important to look for those tides and then plan your trips. Uh, in terms of, I mean, what I have experienced and seen across the years, right, right. The, the couple of days before the no moon and the days after the no moon generally uh, provides great opportunity for showbirds because I don't know the reason, maybe the tidal factor again, but a lot of showbirds that I've seen, which are rarities, for our coast has been during this phase, a couple of days before the uh, no moon day and the days after that. So if you're planning for a you know show bird watching, then do do take into consideration <coughs> the no moon days. <coughs> the no moon days. I would tell people uh, in terms of the uh, night, it is important to choose your style. A lot of people might come and tell you that you know uh, keep the keep the sun keep sun behind you to photograph. But again, that depends on what your style of photography is, what you want to showcase as your images, right? <clears throat> so both opportunities are there to go against light and shoot some lovely sunset and sun rise <coughs> images with the birds, but choose your style. That is important. And in terms of gear, uh, a crop body always helps when you photograph uh, show birds because you are, the birds are small, the birds are tiny. So the extra reach that you get, the magnification that you get will help you. And then a minimum range of 600 to 800 gives you a good proximity to the bird, right? Without disturbing them, without going too close to them, you'll still be able to make a good image if you have that reach of 600 to 800 mm. And uh, with show birds, uh, the light is plenty because you're not in any forest area. You're not covered by any thickets or any, you know, dark, uh, around darkness around you. So what I'm, generally it's best to make use of that, right? Always keep your aperture wider. What it does and what it helps you is to get that smooth background. Because when you open up your aperture, the subject to the background distance helps you to get that clean bouquet. A lot of people keep asking me, why is that your image has a lot of you know smooth backgrounds? That has got nothing to do with Photoshop, to be honest. Right? Photoshop can only enhance what you've actually got. It can never recreate. So keep, I mean, this wider aperture, looking at the distance, looking at the subject to background distance is important. And with show birds, you get a lot of opportunities to do that. Other birds may not because they are in a thicket, they are in the, in the branch which is covered by, you know, leaves. But for show birds, they are all in the open. So you get a lot of time to experiment, to experience, and to choose your photographic style there. <clears throat> Golden rule with the birds as always, understand the bird and the behavior. But with show birds, the other key rule is wait for the bird to come to you. They are they are very specifically not too worried or too bothered about human presence around them because they're so used to it. The fisherman community, you know, generally are around them, right? But all we need to do is instead of going behind them, you find a spot, you find the right uh, place, just wait for it to come. There have been instances or experiences that I've had where the bird walks into the hood of the lens. So that's how, you know, they are when they are actively feeding. You just wait for them to come to you and you get the best possible, uh, you know, images. And <clears throat> always go to the ground, try and see if you can make images from the ground level, the eye level, and wherever possible, use hides and boats uh, when you will try to photograph show birds. <clears throat> few areas like Big One, few areas like Chennai around, right? You have boats, 
that you can take and go inside to look for the birds. It gives you as well a bit of uh, height. As well as the birds are comfortable, it doesn't be bothered. So it gives you good opportunities. And uh, in terms of, as I told about the backgrounds, right? So you get experience with multiple backgrounds. Generally, shores, so it's a boring blue. But what you can do is try and experiment when you go bottom, when you go at the ground level. So you, <coughs> you can make images which are at multi-tone backgrounds. You can make use of the green that is there right behind on the coast or on the islands, right? So that helps. So try and experiment, experiment and experience with different backgrounds. It enhances your image. Uh, for me, as a photographer, a background is as important as the subject. Uh, when you look at the overall tonality of the image, overall quality of the image, it is combination of both that enhances the image. So always don't, uh, you know, think that a background is not that critical. Background is as important as it is, as the subject. Try and make use of those backgrounds that you have. And in terms of ethics, yeah, ethics are really important. Uh, no image is worth at the cost of a bird, All right? So please do, you know, follow the ethics. Uh, try and make sure that the disturbance is as limited as possible. There is no pure on-ground sense to say that there is no disturbance. There are disturbances, but it's about how minimal do we keep it to, right? To disturbing the bird. So have that ethics. It's not told by somebody, it's about you. It's about your own practice. Practice that and kind of keep birds' safety and birds' uh, you know, uh, health more important than the image that you make. At the end of the day, again, something that I, I personally call out to a lot of people who ask me, right? Well, are you are you active on Instagram? Are you active on uh, the social media? Yes, I'm active. Everybody likes a bit of appreciation. But do not get carried away. Aim for perfection when you're making images. And with your birds, you, you get a lot of opportunity to do that, right? Because the birds are not too shy, the birds are not going to run away. So you get a lot of time to practice that and aim for perfection. I hope, uh, you know, these uh, few broad points that I thought would be useful for the audience. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll quickly move on. Uh, I'll share some of the images that I've made of uh, showbirds across India, right? And then also talk about when is the best time to see them. Okay. The first one that I'm sharing is the lesser sand clover. Uh, these are very common uh, across all, the entire coast. You would see them across any any beaches around, and they are uh, local migrants as well. So they do not. I mean, there are some which migrates beyond the borders, but majority of uh, breeding, uh, you know, colony is there in Ladakh. So people who are in Ladakh during May and uh, May, June, July, August should look for these birds in the uh, Pasangso River and the Kosokar uh, River areas because they would be in the full breeding plumages. They have been recorded in Manasarovar as well, right? As high as uh, Manasarovar. And in the plains, March to April is the best time to look for them. Uh, one tip that I would want to kind of share with people is uh, with these birds, uh, you know, you just need to wait, give them time. They'll keep coming closer to you. And this image was made uh, in April. So that's when you see the bird, uh, you know, attending their breeding plumage. Slightly the, the orange stone has started building in. And then in the in, in the months to come, it will migrate from the Chinese heat all the way to uh, the Himalayan <coughs> boundaries. Uh, the one next is the little stink. Again, very common show bird that you would get to see across our coast. Very beautiful bird, very tiny. Uh, the best time to see again is between October to April. Uh, one suggestion that I have I mean, a photographic tip that I will give us, you would need a bit of high shutter speeds to kind of get these birds uh, in more in a perfect frame because they are very active. So you would keep finding them moving from uh, from place running around, right? So a high shutter speed will always help. The long toed stilt. This one is a rare migrant for the uh, inland but very common in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So you would get to see them in the Andaman Islands uh, much easier compared to uh, the inland coast. And the best time to see this bird is between, again, in inland is between October and March, but uh, in the islands is pretty much throughout the year. Okay. This one was photographed again in Pulikat. So most of my images uh, that you might see is from Pulikat, but I'll call out those uh, which are not. And this yeah. is one beautiful bird. The ruddy tombstone, uh, they, they again are uh, migrants, migrates locally, and uh, majority of the colonies breeds in the Russian Arctic. Uh, again, winter is the best time to see them. 
And when you see them, uh, don't just stop uh, looking at them uh, and look at their behavior as well. The reason why they call the turn stones are basically because of the way they take the stones and roll it out to pull the feed and the foot below the stones. And that's typically the name uh, ready turn stone. Uh, this one again, Sanderling, very common uh, showbird that you'll find uh, across uh, the, the coastline. Uh, this is, in fact, found across Europe as well, very commonly. And uh, Sanderlings are, are bold. They allow you to, they allow, they come close to uh, us and you, whenever you are on the, on the shore waiting for them. Again, one more bird that will give you a lot of opportunities to uh, photograph. Uh, this one is a very rare uh, vagrant for India. Uh, it's called the gray tailed tattler. They are basically found between the China, uh, between the borders of China and Japan, all the way to Australia during their migration. In India, there have been only few records for this bird. Uh, right? In, uh, it was in 2017, 2018, uh, if I'm not wrong, 2016 or 17. The couple of years where uh, it was recorded in Chennai. And the first year when people uh, recorded it, they didn't identify it as a tattler. They thought it is yet another drab looking uh, you know, plover. That's generally what I hear my friends tell me whenever I show them images of uh, showbirds. All of them look the same. All right. So, mm -hmm. but this bird was uh, later identified to be the great tailed tattler, a very rare uh, bird for uh, the subcontinent. Uh, very few records have been there from Bangladesh's coast in, in migration. But for India, there have been a couple of records, one from uh, Pulika, the other one more recently from Goa. So this again, I mean, the reason why I want to say the, about the, the vagrants is it's not that the bird is rare, it's just that look out for on the shores. There is very few people looking out on the vast coastline. So wherever you are, there are opportunities to kind of uh, help uh, the scientists, help the researchers, help the ornithologists identify these kind of species that calls India home, right? Be it yeah. during the passage or be it during... Uh, winters very important for uh, for studies very important for conservation where people kind of look at all the uh, you know opportunities to look for birds identify them and uh, document their presence which will help uh, you know at various quarters the best time to see based on my experience the last the couple of seasons that we have seen it is only during the first few weeks of september maybe okay. the, the, the cyclones might bring them in coast or uh, the the passage cuts through the coast so that's the best time uh, to look for these birds. Uh, the next one is the curly sandpiper. They are near the 10 species in terms of their, uh, you know, listing, not uh, endangered, but they are near threatened, which means if you don't conserve them, if you don't conserve the habitats, these are potential birds that might get extinct. All right. So it's the importance of the habitat is why I want to showcase this bird as well. Our habitats are very important for these birds when they migrate. And this one is in full, uh, you know, breeding colors. This was shot in uh, April. This bird you can see across uh, Jamnagar, uh, you know, in the south coast in Chennai, Tamil Nadu, again in Kundapur. Uh, there are a lot of uh, records from West Bengal as well, where they group together before they migrate. So one of those most beautiful looking sandpipers. Uh, these are very common, the Eurasian curlews. They are found in uh, inland water bodies as well as in the shores. Uh, very, very cooperative birds when you when you kind of look for them early in the mornings or late in the evenings. They are slightly crepuscular in their feeding habits. That is when the light comes out on the, on the, at the end of the day, they are very active feeding. So that's the time when, you know, as a photographer, you would want to be there in the right place. So you get good opportunities to photograph this bird. Again, speaking about what I told uh, in terms of my experiences, the multi-tone backgrounds, so on this image, you would see that, you know, I've not just limited myself to the water. I wanted to make use of the, the <coughs> uh, mud or the sand that is there at the shore, as well as the tree line that's at the back. So this gave me a nice three-tone background. And uh, as a photographer, what you need to do is alter your, uh, you know, heights or levels of uh, where you are. Because in terms of if you go completely low, I would have made an image where the, it's completely blue at the back. So slightly on the on the seated up position, I was able to get a three tone layer and experiment uh, these when you are on the shows. It will enhance your image. It will enhance the quality of the uh, image as well as a photographer. The most uh, known and the uh, colorful bird on the Vader world, right? The Eurasian oyster catcher. 
these are very very active birds uh, quite shy as well uh, best time to see them are again in winters between october and march uh, it's it's seen now it's been recorded across most of the places in the coast kerala has had good records tamil nadu had good records jamnagar every year sees a good population of these birds very beautiful uh, spend time with this birds you will see the way they pick up the oysters they op- you know pick open the oyster and then feed it it will be fun to watch uh wimbrels again very close to the eurasian curlews very common across all our coast uh very active bird in the uh, uh beginning of the day and towards the end of the day <coughs> uh this one lesser nordy again uh this is not uh or seen often they are basically more of uh, the sea birds right what what we call as the birds that lives in sea hardly comes to the shore for uh, uh, during the breeding season uh, mostly seen in maldives and the Mori- uh, maldives and the coast uh, luckily in uh, tn we have had two three years where this bird was frequenting uh, during the uh, late july to september period so again these kind of birds gives you a lot of opportunity to experience i mean experiment with flight shots because they are very active they keep flying above the water level so you tend to experience and experiment with your uh, birds and flight shots uh, very important i mean again the other one which kind of is a eye catcher uh, that i call when i speak to people right is the terex sandpiper uh, i have i have seen a lot of european birders quite excited about terex sandpiper uh, right i mean that has been uh, one of the birds in the show birds or the vedas category which has a slightly upward curved beak uh, maybe the reason why uh, you know it stands out but very very active bird it keeps running around uh, from a photographic tip what i would suggest is you need fast shutters uh, to get this uh, frame all right and then what i've added to the end is the veda quest organization had put up a pin on this bird uh, using my image we published a pin uh, which which was used for collecting funds to conserve the birds so that's the importance our coast brings out to somebody who's in uk all right imagine imagine what indian coast is offering for conservationists who are spread across the world as a photographer what you do i mean a lot of people say you're just photographing birds but as a photographer this is the contribution that you do towards conservation right it need not be direct efforts it it are these indirect efforts that you do the yeah, image right. that helping people to collect funds to save a species is not easy mm-hmm. right so as a photographer you need to feel proud about these and thank the uh, the the opportunities that you get uh most common ones the lesser flamingos uh these are uh, seen in uh, chennai's coast very rarely we do get them once in 3 or 4 years uh, during the winters but the best place to see them is the little ram catch or the savory mud flats apart from jamnagar at savory mud flats you will i'm sure you know a lot of people have seen those lovely images coming from bombay on that sea woods uh, area right and as a photographer tip uh, when you are when you are looking at uh, flamingos uh, the lesser flamingos especially try and spend time wait for it to make that courtship display it's beautiful when all of those flamingos come together they stick the net uh, neck out and they do a kind of a dance ritual right which is which is the uh, courtship display which is very beautiful to watch and uh, let's close uh, connect the greater flamingos they are uh, in india throughout the year it's it's now commonly recorded at most places the thing with flamingos is give them time and you will be able to make great images uh, when you when you when you maintaining your distance these birds keep coming closer to you so all you need to do is when, when you first see the bird try and make a cautious approach towards it don't rush through clo- to get closer it will naturally come uh, moving towards you when it starts feeding and coming towards you that's the best time you you get to experience uh, good photography opportunities i thought uh, you know this is what i wanted to quickly connect before i close uh, in terms of uh, thanks thanks to hermes for giving me an opportunity again yeah. uh, hope uh, people have found this i i have kept it in tidbits because i don't want to add too much of information most of the people <laughs> on the forum know about it uh, so what i thought would help is those little experiences that i've had especially in terms of when do you look out for these birds what do you kind of what's the photographic tip that i can offer when you especially on the lookout for a show bird so hope you find this useful happy to pick up any comments or any questions
yeah <clears throat> thank you thank you so much arvind it was a amazing session uh, a lot of lot of uh, knowledge you shared with us great thank you so much we have a couple of questions as well uh, let me so uh, one more time uh, what is the main challenge for photographing shorebirds the main challenge as a color is first is the tides so you need to be there at the right time because if yeah. you're going to go look for shorebirds during a high tide there is very limited possibility that you will see them closer it will be far off in a small island where water levels haven't hit right so look out for low tides uh, identify the best time to be there on the coast and uh, the other challenge that you have is uh, be mindful of the heat waves as well right because especially for somebody who is in the co uh, in the hot areas right uh, the yeah. heat waves start picking up in water much sooner so by 8:30 9 in the mornings you will when you try to photograph these birds right there will be a artifact uh, waves that comes up on your images might distort your quality of uh, outcome so those times the best is to kind of look for the late evenings because you in summers the late evenings uh, the light is there until much later so you get a nice beautiful longer time of the golden light make use of that so look for yeah. uh, the the sun, the sunlight as well as the uh, the timing of tides those are two uh, you know challenges as well as opportunities okay okay and we have a question from sonal uh, which or bird was most difficult for you to photograph uh, i would definitely call out the oyster catches uh, my experiences started in the year 2013 when i first uh, saw them in uh, our coast right and uh, it used to be a tiny speck on my camera when i shot those images because it was way far and the minute we approach it will be like flying miles away and then from 2013 the image that you saw uh, the one that i show showcased yeah. was made in 2018 so it took oh. me about 5 years to <laughs> wait to get closer to that bird so that's definitely one of the most uh, you know challenging bird to photograph because you don't see them in big numbers here you just tend, generally tend to get one or two birds and uh, they are very wary of uh, human presence so it's very difficult but opportunities come so uh, i mean the experience taught us that you know wait for it <laughs> yes and uh, which is your favorite bird when it comes to shorebirds favorite bird to photograph <laughs> uh for anybody it's a dream that you get to see the spoonbill sandpiper so that would be the favorite uh, one hopefully someday in some coast of india we would be able to find a bird uh, which is on which places that we have not explored but these birds do frequent that's something that i am confident about so yeah. that that's one of the birds that i'm interested and uh, you know i would want to definitely do look for that bird in our lifetime all right so so that would be the most uh, exciting one apart from that uh, the oyster catches are our personal favorites because they 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 made me slog for it <laughs> so it's definitely one on the list okay uh, most of the shore birds are uh, always moving so what is the most important thing in photography uh, to capture the uh, fast moving birds so i think most so, of the people uh, find tough in getting sharp pictures right so two things as i said one is your aperture so a lot of people try to think that you know the light is harsh go at uh, you know smaller apertures f8 f9 people tend to go at that no uh, you know get your iso down because that's the best time to keep your iso low keep your apertures wide open increase yeah. your shutter speed all right so typically 1 1 by 1000 1 by 1500 of second gives you best chances to uh, you know freeze those birds at the same time as i said uh, understanding their behaviors is very important right when they are feeding they generally because the time they get to feed is very small when the before the water starts coming in these birds have mm -hmm. to make use of the time that they have to feed so that's the, that's a time that they are not too bothered as long as you maintain the distance so at those instances it will give you good opportunities to uh, freeze them because they would stop in between to look for the feed pick it up and then uh, you know you'll get a couple of minutes uh, freezing opportunity for that okay uh yeah the uh, next question is uh, based on the same thing that we spoke now uh how important it is to study birds behavior it is very very important without a birds behavior understanding a behavior you would not going to get uh, any good images right because i mean any image i mean good image or any image every image is a good image i won't say that but what i'm saying is 
for you to be satisfied at the end of the day, you will be satisfied only when you knew how to approach it, when you know what the bird would do. And that's when you make the best opportunity and the best use of what you've got. So it is important. Yeah. If I'm going, if I don't understand that a flamingo would come close to me if, if it's on a feeding uh, habit, feeding during the feeding time, if I don't, uh, you know, understand that that bird will keep coming close to me and I'm going to go approach it, you will be keep pushing the bird further. But when you start off maintaining the distance and then you understand that yes, they're going to feed now, you will see them without, uh, you know, worrying about your presence. It will start coming closer. So understanding the behavior is very important. Uh, you would know when the birds are, uh, what, is the, what is the minimum distance that the birds would expect, right? Something like the sand clovers are very common and they're used to the human presence. So they would allow you much more closer than a rare passage migrant or a vagrant comes in. But again, surprising experiences that I've had, these rare passage migrants and the ones that are passing through India, right? That phase when they're migrating, that yeah. phase the birds are not worried about uh, human presence much because for them, it is important to bulk up their food, uh, make sure of the time that they spend in the coast is effectively used for feeding so that they generate the fat that is required to cross the shores. So again, uh, this, these all are things that, is that you get only by understanding the behaviors. Without that, you're not going to know about this and you're going to try, you know, experience, I mean, try going out, looking for these birds and chasing it out. And at the end of the day, you may not uh, you know, feel satisfied that you've got a good image. So understanding behavior is as important as, uh, you know, anything else I would say. Yeah. So, and uh, you said you have traveled most of the places in India. Uh, which is the which is your favorite location to shoot birds? Uh, mine personally, I mean, it's a very difficult question, right? I was thousand three hundred <laughs> across the country. Uh, but when it comes to show birds, uh, it is it is being Pulikat. Uh, with the days when I started, right uh, between our friends, we used to talk. If you look at uh, showbirds, I think we'll have to head up at Jamnal. You have to go to Jamnal okay. to see these showbirds. But then what happened is, as we started exploring more these coasts, we realized mm -hmm. that the species that you see in Jamnagar is more or less there in our coast. So, Pulikat has been very close to us. We have spent years kind of uh, documenting yeah. the species there, uh, working closely with the uh, with the you know uh, the boatmen there and help them kind of have a you know a career beyond just fishing. So that way, we yeah. feel that you know, we have contributed to the society a bit. Uh, right, with somebody getting a, getting a career out of it. Uh, so, okay. so Pulikat has been very close, but outside of Pulikat, for us, as typical any Indian and any Indian birder, uh, the Northeast is amazing. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is How should one take care of the sunlight refraction on water while photographing shorebirds? Uh, this is the one that I spoke about a little earlier in terms of the heat waves and the artifacts that it created. Yeah. Uh, there is no easy way out or a shortcut available. The only thing is to stop shooting when the, when the heat waves <laughs> come up, right? So make use of the time that you have in the day when the when the sun is soft. The, the first light that you get and the first couple okay. of hours when the sun is at the uh, at still, uh, you know, taking off to a higher uh, height, that's the yeah. time to shoot. When you when you see water, uh, the, the heat waves coming in, it's time to pack the gears and I would say, you know, don't waste your time there. That's <laughs> Yes. So, any 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 other interesting uh, experience you had while shooting birds? We've had uh, much uh, a few experiences, right? In terms of once we when we were in uh, Pulikat birding, we did see these uh, fishing nets. A couple of birds getting entangled on the fishing nets, oh. and then you know we we took that time to go uh, you know un unfreeze those nets, let the bird free. So those are experiences that you get uh, which which are more satisfying. And yeah. uh, we, we've had days, uh, I mean, it's not that all the images have been made in one day whenever we went out, right? So the big, biggest experiences have been days where we've come uh, come back empty-handed. So <laughs> we, we keep looking for them. Uh, we, yeah. we, miss, we miss the tide or miss the uh, time. And then, uh, you know, those days are frustrating on the field, but satisfying because you would have spent time trying to you know, check why what has gone wrong. Why didn't you see a bird on that day, right? And then you realize that you were at the wrong time. Yes. The tides were unfavorable. And uh, you know the timing was not right. So, so every experience is, is amazing. It helps you learn a bit. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's always about the nature, right? So you spend time, whether birds are there or not. You pick up a couple right. of things that you can learn and uh, you know understand about nature. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think uh, that's all uh, the questions we have. And 
uh, most of the questions you already answered in your session <laughs> like presentation itself so <laughs> it was pretty uh, clear uh, from the beginning useful. so i hope uh, that has been useful for people yeah definitely yes and uh, thank you so much aramit so uh, hopefully we will come up with another session with some other subject thanks Something special like this thanks for the opportunity yeah and i'm yeah. Uh, yeah i have shared my uh, you know contact details with hermes so anybody wants yes, to connect yes. further happy to connect definitely yeah definitely <laughs> okay thank you thank and you. see you soon yeah see you bye so yeah that was aravind excellent presentation a lot of knowledge uh and i have learned a lot of things a lot of new things as always interesting so let's uh wait for the next session uh thank you guys for watching and take care see you soon bye for now